Calling the March 14th Petaluma City Schools Board of Education meeting to order at 5.02. We're gonna acknowledge AB 361. We are still in a hybrid fashion. Um, are there any comments from the public on closed session items? We are going to adjourn to closed session. All right, we are reconvening at 6.02. It is now time to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Special recognitions, reports, and presentations. We have Students of the Month from Kenilworth, Petaluma Junior, CASA, Petaluma High, and site reports from Kenilworth and Petaluma High School. All right, so we will start with Students of the Month. Tonight we have two, ooh, hey, two students who are not with us uh, from Kenilworth. We'll be recognizing June at our next meeting and the same with Malia. So if you're wondering, we're not forgetting anyone. We just have a few absent students. Simon Cassis. Simon was chosen student of the month because he is one of Kenworth's most impressive student athletes. Simon excels in all of his classes, maintaining a 4.0 grade point average while, while participating and performing at the highest level in three sports at Kenworth. Simon's history teacher, Mr. Eklund, shared Simon is like a ninja. He is very quiet and unassuming during class. And just when you think that no one is going to raise their hand to answer your question, you could count on Simon to have the answer for you. Whatever we are doing in class, I know Simon will be engaged, inquisitive, and on task. I look forward to knowing Simon will be there. During Simon's time as a cult, he's excelled both in the classroom and in sports. Simon runs cross country, plays basketball, and is the member of our track and field team. As a seventh grader, Simon was the league champion in both the 800 meters and long jump. Simon is looking forward to improving on last year's efforts on the track this spring. Simon is also a dedicated reader and enjoys the Rangers Apprentice series. After high school, Simon would like to attend a good university likely in California and pursue a degree in engineering discipline. It is truly a pleasure to have a student like Simon. And do we have Simon's friends and family in the audience? We want to clap for you too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then can we have Petaluma Junior High, the team, come on up?
Petaluma Junior High is proud to introduce our March Student of the Month, Aiden Jones. Aiden, ha Aiden was chosen by his teachers as Student of the Month for his constantly strong academic performance and for being an all-around great student. Aiden and Joe's Aiden enjoys his time at PJHS sharing that he appreciates all of his teachers and staff on campus. They're always bright and happy and willing to help. Aiden is extremely busy outside of school. He plays both a guitar and the banjo. He originally started playing guitar during the pandemic as a way to defeat boredom. This led to Aiden Jones starting to listen to bluegrass musicians like Billy String. So he picked up playing the banjo too. After PJHS, Aiden is looking forward to play baseball at Paraluma High School. Aiden believes that playing for the Trojans will be a great way to represent his school and his community. When asked about the school, when asked about life after high school, Aiden shares that his goal is to get drafted to play major league baseball. If the major league doesn't provide possible, then he'd like to pursue acting or a career in music. In college, in terms of college, Aiden plans to attend UC Berkeley on a baseball scholarship. Congratulations, Aiden. And then do I have Aiden's friends and family here? If y'all can stand up or wave. So next up we have Casa Grande. Hi, my name is Emily and I'm Casa's ASB president. Our first student of the month is Janessa Pond. Janessa has attended two high schools previously before coming to Casa Grande, St. Vincent's and Tech High, and has excelled in athletics and the classroom at all three high schools. Throughout her time in high school, she played varsity basketball, soccer, lacrosse, tennis, and track, her best sport in which she holds multiple records. While playing all of these sports and working as a hostess, tutoring, and babysitting, she has remained a great student, maintaining straight A's all through high school. After high school, she plans on going to St. Mary's, where she will major in psychology so that she, beco so she can become a high school counselor. Congratulations. <laughs> and I know we have Janessa's friends and family here, if y'all can stand up. And our next student of the month is Isaac Sullivan. Isaac, a previous recipient of student of the month as an eighth grader at Kenilworth, has continued his dedication to his studies at Casa Grande. Along with his passion in the classroom, Isaac is heavily involved in his school community. He has enjoyed participating in Casa's basketball program as a freshman and as a junior on the junior varsity team. Isaac is spending his senior year teaching the sixth graders at his former school, Pangrove Elementary, to create their own school newspaper through Casa Grande's capstone project. With the assistance of Pengrove sixth graders, Isaac has helped them create an ad, a newspaper complete with articles, comics, photography, and advertisements for the enjoyment of the school and its small downtown business district. Isaac discovered his passion for journalism in Casa Grande's outstanding journalism program led by Mrs. Pichota, which has inspired him to consider a career in sports journalism. Isaac understands the importance of excellence within the classroom, but realizes that school is not just education, it is an experience that requires student involvement in order to be fully appreciated. Isaac is thankful to Casa's community for allowing him to have the ultimate high school experience and for preparing him to attend one of the many colleges he has applied to. Congratulations. And then can Isaac's friends and family please stand up. And last but not least, we have Petaluma High.
My name is Kenna Lowry and I'm Petaluma High's ASB Vice President. Um, our first student of the month is from February actually, Aiden Webb. Aiden Webb is almost a straight A student at Petaluma High School. He grew up in and around Petaluma. He played football and wrestled freshman year. He earned his varsity letter as a freshman and was freshman of the year on the wrestling team. A couple other achievements include being vice president of the phase club all four years, being in accelerated math classes, and being active in Petaluma FFA. Another accomplishment is reaching the rank of Eagle Scout in the BSA. After high school, he plans on attending a trade course and pursuing a career in the welding field. Some schools of interest in include Butte and Modesto Colleges. Outside of school, Aiden worked for Mickelson Inc. at their Christmas tree farm and pumpkin patch. Other jobs he has held include Wilco and Friedman's. Aiden's welding teacher, Mr. Dunn, had the following to say about him. Aiden is in his third year of FFA and has completed ag classes in ag mechanics and welding. His currently, he is currently one of our advanced welders and excels in projects design and construction. Aiden is never af afraid to try new things and follows through with the commitments he makes. It has been a pleasure working with him over the past four years. I know that his passion for mechanics will carry him very far as he moves on from PHS. As a fourth year automotive student, Aiden's auto teacher, Mr. Benson said the following. As a freshman, he spent nearly every break and lunch in the shop working on a Hemi engine swap into Chrysler 300. He is the leader of his work group. Aiden is a very capable student who helps others and stays productive in class. He isn't afraid to try new things and diagnose complex pro problems. As a metal student, he built his own welding cart and performed the other projects quickly and precisely. Congratulations, Aiden. And do we have Aiden's friends and family here in the audience? Okay, Carson. Hey, Carson. Hey, Carson. Next up, we have Carson De La Rosa. Carson De La Rosa is an 18-year-old senior at Petaluma High School and is currently the editor-in-chief of the Trojan Tribune. With personal drive and motivation to do whatever he puts his mind to, Carson shows up for daily commitments to the paper, to his classes, to the gym, and to his homework. He enjoys spending time with friends and family, helping some of them reach their goals at the gym, and catching up on his favorite shows or sketching in his notebook. He loves the world of science fiction that being Marvel, DC, Transformers, and My Hero Academia, just to name a few, and is, slightly obsessed, is a slightly obsessed collector of animated figures. Carson has worked very hard to get to where he is today and stands resilient despite personal hardships and life-changing losses in the past four years. Overcoming adversity, he's never wavered from his dedication to his responsibilities and vision for the future, pushing forward and working even harder when obstacles arise. The support of his journalism mentor and advisor who believed in him and supported his readiness for the editor-in-chief role this year enabled him to achieve his goals. Carson takes pride in a job well done and strives to be his best every day, especially in leading and helping the newspaper staff to be their best. Guided by a strong desire to be a source of comfort for others, one of his mottos is, if you help someone, you help everyone. He appreciates his years at PHS and plans to attend a four-year college and pursue a, pursue a career in journalism or photography. This recognition means a great deal to Carson in these final months of his high school career. Ms. Redfield, Carson's AP Lang teacher, mentor, and journalism advisor stated, in his freshman year, Carson was late to his first day of journalism. In his senior year, Carson stands before you as editor-in-chief Proof of a character arc worthy of the best comic books. No matter the losses and tribulations that he faces, Carson always gets back up and continues the fight. As editor-in-chief, he understands the power of the press and the responsibility that comes with it to inform the community, raise voices of those who may not be heard, 
and to hold those who abuse their power accountable. Carson is truly a spectacular young man who exemplifies the best of Petaluma High. Congratulations, Carson. <laughs> and can we have Carson's friends and family stand up? Hello. Okay, next up we have Langley Durham. In her four years at Petaluma High School, Langley Durham has been an integral community leader and member. She has participated in several clubs, including Skills USA and Phase Club, while maintaining excellent grades in her high school and Santa Rosa Junior College classes. She has faced many challenges, including type 1 diabetes and the global pandemic. She has worked worked in the PHS metal shop for three years and the PHS auto shop for one year. In her time there, she has received two National Institute of Metalworking Skills certifications and is working on her third. Langley was an integral part of the Student Advisory Council her sophomore year and took part in getting PHS and Casa Grande High School student board members. She has put time and love into Petaluma High School community and hopes to continue making a positive impact as she faces the rest of her life. She loves working in the metal shop and is even the secretary of the phase club. Her metal and auto shop teacher, Keith Benson, says, one of Langley's strongest attributes is her willingness to overcome, persevere, and push through complex engineering projects without giving up prematurely. Because of this, I have no doubt in my mind that Langley will pursue and accomplish great things in life. I've been blessed as a teacher to play a small part in her pursuit of achieving greatness. Following high school, Langley plans to attend the Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa Junior College with intent to transfer to University of California, Davis for mechanical engineering. Congratulations, Langley. And can we have Langley's friends and family please stand up. All right, all you students of the month don't go anywhere. Just do we want to do pictures after? Or? I think we should do the picture now. Let's do all the all the students of the month come up here real quick and let's take a big group photo. If you guys can you grab your flag, Isaac, bring your go up against the, the table, right? Oh, thank so you. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you so much. All right, um, students in the front, you guys can just slightly kneel for me for these. Sorry. All right, there you go. All right, ready? One, two, three. Let me duck for your parents <laughs> and your friends and your family. Thank you. Congratulations. And now we would love to hear some site reports. Welcome to Welcome to Kenworth Junior High School board report for March 14, 2023. Kenworth is continuing to thrive throughout the various activities our school has to offer. Students are building confidence, awareness, and are continuing to be successful. Around campus, you can always find our Kenilworth Colts enjoying each other's company during break and lunch. Our Colts have access to both of the quads to socialize in the morning, at break, and at lunch, and love hanging out in both. Rain or shine, you can always find our Colts with their friends. We are all about having fun and making memories at KJHS. One of the many exciting events our Kenworth Colts await for is our is the robotics fair. With our Colts by our side, all the memories are more amazing and 10 times better. The sports going on around our campus are track and wrestling. The wrestling team, displayed in two of the four photos, just earned second place in a previous tournament to end off the year. 
In the other two photos, track students are shown running around to prepare for upcoming meets. Colts have been having so much fun in class, not only learning, but also doing plays and enjoying PE. With all the events and activities in the classroom to keep students occupied, everyone's been having so much fun with the time remaining until spring break. Our Colts here at Kenilworth have a one-of-a-kind worth ethic that leads us to receiving a pennant for the eighth grade girls basketball team. Our dream team at Kenilworth isn't just a team that wins. It's also a team where the athletes work together, build friendships, and learn the responsibility as a student athlete. We are so proud of our sports teams at Kenilworth. At Kenilworth Junior High, we have many spirit days. Throughout these past months, we have had Decade Red Day, Blizzard Day, and Decades Day, and our weekly Black and Gold Day. Our Colts love to demonstrate their school spirit by showing up and showing out on these awesome days at school. Drama has put on a perfect show of how to survive junior high for all of Kenilworth. They had a strong performance, and the actors did a terrific job at acting and really became the character they were playing. We hope that our drama class continues to create awesome plays for all. Here at Kenilworth, we also have Fun Fridays. Fun Fridays are when leadership provides a game at lunch for all the students. Some of our most popular were tug of war and musical chairs. We usually have two them two times a month and all of the students here at Kenilworth look forward to them. Some upcoming events we have this week are Twin Day, Green Day, and Tacky Tourist Day. Lights, camera, action, Colts are also looking forward to a fun Hollywood themed dance. This Thursday, Kenilwood track team has their first track meet against LJ. Kenilworth's camper campus is not only a safer place, but also a greener place. We have installed our new trash cans around campus to help students with recycling and our new addition, composting. The new program at KJHS will make the school cleaner and make our students overall good citizens to the community. The Kenilworth leadership class is a very hardworking class. They put pride in their work and get the job done. They help set up all the dances, fun Fridays, and other school activities. Mr. Mori and Ms. Denon have been putting a lot of work into taking care of our school. This month, we have been focusing on keeping our clean campus and helping our environment. Kenilworth is focusing on rewarding our students who are using our motto, Kenilworth Cares, and using their life skills. We are so proud of all of our Colts' hard work and look forward to seeing this throughout the rest of the year. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Petaluma Junior High. Hi, I'm Oni, and I'm an eighth grade leadership student at PJHS. Hi, I'm Callan. I'm an eighth grade leadership student at PJHS. Hi, I'm Declan. I'm a P uh, leadership eighth grade leadership student at PJHS. Over the course of three days in January, PJHS has hosted over 250 sixth graders from eight different elementary schools in Petaluma. Sixth grade tour week is an opportunity for students in Petaluma to preview our junior high school by visiting classrooms and connecting with current PJHS students. It was an exciting week with special visits from our band to mascots and a warm welcome provided one morning by the PJHS band. During the tours, teachers spanning a variety of subjects welcomed sixth graders into their classrooms. Tours were led by eighth grader leadership students who also provided their perspective on life in the junior high school. Sixth graders also had the opportunity to hear from a panel of seventh graders who shared their stories of transition into PJHS. Our eighth graders had the opportunity to tour Petaluma Junior 
to tour Petaluma High School in meet current PHS students. Our tour began with a reception by the PHS Link Crew, a group of juniors and seniors whose purpose is to engage and support the incoming freshman class to develop student leaders and their build a culture of support, inclusion, and positive energy. After our welcome reception, um, students were <laughs> led on a walking tour of campus where they had the opportunity to visit locations such as the PHS library, the ag shop, metal shop, and auto shop, Trojan broadcast, the Petaluma Wildlife Museum, the Trojan stores, and the PHS sports faculties asking questions of link crew leaders along the way. What I enjoyed most about visiting PHS was the um, seeing the school through the students' eyes. In January, we were able to send about 160 students through to see the Footsteps of Freedom exhibit on display at the PJHS library. We want to thank H Hardy Brown Emeritus Chairman of the Black Voice Foundation for sharing his time, knowledge, rare artifacts, and passionate storytelling with our community. Mr. Brown's exhibit was eye-opening for our students, asking each visitor to consider what they can do to stand on the right side of history. Here's a brief look at the event. <laughs> In January, in January, Ms. Dende was able to accompany many of our seventh grade science students as they visited the Lazy R Ranch in Tamales in order to participate in the local education programs called Students and Teachers Restoring a Watershed Straw. Students planted trees all along Stemple Creek in order to benefit the ecosystem. Oh my god. Oh okay. We're lucky that um we're lucky that this habitat reservation location is at PJ Just Science teacher Linda Judah's family ranch. Straw field trips are a great way for students to get hands-on learning and gain exposure to college age young adults who pursue scientific study. In early February, our PE department welcomed the PE fire department, welcomed the Petaluma Fire Department with support from the Petaluma Healthcare District and Save Live Sonoma to lead our seventh and eighth graders through hands only CPR. It was an impressive sight to see our students revisiting this life saving training. Many thanks to our Petaluma Fire Department and the Petaluma Healthcare District and Save Live Sonoma for making this training possible. Here's a short video of the training in action. In February, our... 
Gracias. Um, in February, our leadership students teamed up with Petaluma People Services to create Valentines for, students, for senior citizens in our community. In addition, they were also busy making Valentines for the dedicated volunteers that run Petaluma Education Foundation's downtown thrift store alphabet soup. Check out their creativity. In March, we also celebrated two PJHS staff members who have dedicated 25 years to serving Petaluma students. Here are, member, here are the members of CAT celebrating their work of instructional assistant, Ms. Shockey, and PE teacher, Mr. Tucker. In March, our leadership team welcomed our South County, South County Consortium's Life Skills class for a collaboration our life posters or our life skills students spent the day with leadership making posters for our upcoming spring kindness dance, connecting on personal interests and having fun together. Last week was a busy week for many seventh graders who had the opportunity to visit PHS, uh, PHS's teacher Phil Takata and his teacher and his students at the Petaluma Wildlife Museum. Our students were welcomed by docents such as Mia Vaughn, here giving our students an uh, opportunity to meet a blue tongued skink. Our STEM program continues to demonstrate how curiosity and willingness to take risks can lead through high levels of, or lead to high levels of engagement in the classroom. Check out Ms. Brooks Long's STEM class during their water tower engineering competitions. Go for it. Other engaging STEM activities this semester include planting kale and lettuce in our garden, engineering devices that would suit an artificial limb, and using augmented reality technology and merge cubes to learn about our planet. Ms. Mantuani's seventh graders have finished reading Harriet Tubman, conductor on the Underground Railroad, and are now writing to President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, or Secretary of, of the Te Treasury, Janet Yellen, voicing their opinions about the about Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar bill. Kamala Harris's office, especially, was great about writing to students, uh, writing students back last year, and students were excited to see what happens this year. Wrestling and track and field are sports that the Bantams are participating in this spring. And most importantly, Petaluma Junior High School has fun. Pivot, jump, jump, jump. Wow. Here you see students playing Monopoly at lunch, a Valentine's Day match. Pivot, jump, jump, jump. And Miss Brooks Long seventh grade students uh, teaching their her their dance routine from PE. That's it. <laughs> Thank you.
And then we, ooh, we had one, um, one of our students of the month, Malia, who we thought was going to join us next month. Um, she actually is on zoom with her family. So, um, we're going to actually read about her. They were prepared to read about her tonight. So we're going to just hear about Malia and then everyone in the audience, you guys will get to go right after this. Petaluma Junior High School is proud to introduce our March Student of the Month, Malia Pratt. Malia was chosen by her teachers as the Student of the Month due to her hard work, her kindness, her enthusiasm, and her altogether pleasant attitude. When asked what she most enjoyed about PJHS, Malia shares that her leadership class with Miss Frush is a particular favorite. Miss Frush gives students a lot of freedom and she never brings you down. Malia also enjoys her English class with Miss Sullivan because of how much she has learned this year. Outside of school, Malia practices dance. When her hearing of Malia's honor, her parents, Mary and Steve, shared she is a bright light in our lives and we admire her curiosity about the world around her. Her ten <laughs> tendency to solve problems and her kindness towards others, she is a genuine gem and we love her so much. After PJHS, Malia is looking forward to, meet new, to meeting new people, learning from new teachers, and participating in new experiences. When asked about the future, Malia has always been interested in interior design. Recently, however, she has also become interested in marine biology. Her dream would be to go to college in Hawaii, but she'd be satisfied going anywhere near the beach. Congratulations, Malia. Right. Once again, congratulations to all the students of the month. And thank you, Kenilworth and Petaluma Jr. for your site reports. We are going to take a five minute break so our students can leave if they would like. All right. Reconvening at 644. Next up is Chris Thomas with the update on transportation. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to um, actually, it's my pleasure to introduce Marsha Short. I don't know how many of you have actually gotten to meet Marsha. She is our Director Hello. of Transportation and Fleet Management. Um, she's been with us almost six years now. Um, and it's not an easy job, I can tell you that right now. There's one job in the district that I really don't want to do. <laughs> it's transportation. Anyway, so we have a PowerPoint tonight, and then we're going to go over and review the actual transportation report. But first, we want to give you a report kind of on who who and what transportation is, what we do, and um, yeah, and then be able to answer questions you might have. And then we'll go right into the transportation report itself. Marsha? Good evening. So our team consists of myself, Marsha, uh, my senior secretary. We have four bus drivers, two substitute bus drivers, two drivers actually in training as we speak, and nine for student contract drivers. We have a one full-time auto mechanic, three, and a two standby driver slash mechanic helpers. Thanks, David. What it takes to become a school bus driver. We need a minimum of 20 hours of classroom. That doesn't include the new federal guidelines for the entry-level driver training, um, which was implemented last February. They need 20 hours of minimum behind the wheel driving with whatever bus they're driving. And then everybody coming through does a written and drive test with California Highway Patrol. And I just wanna say that <clears throat> Marsha actually is our certified trainer as well. So she's able to do most of that with the exception of the CHP test, obviously the CHP does that. And these are really rigorous. If you could imagine being behind the wheel of a 40 foot bus, having a <laughs> CHP officer sitting next to you and and you have to drive. Um, it's it's very intimidating to say the least. So it usually takes people how many opportunities to pass the test? Depending on the person, could be up to 30. And anything beyond 50, you're having a second look at it. We see people maybe at the four to six times. So <laughs> but but it is hard, it is hard. I, the reason I bring it up is because I this it, it's not easy to become a bus driver. And so it does take quite a bit of time 
an effort not only for the written and then really learning how to navigate and drive a bus, but then having to pass um, pass a, a test with the CHP officer. Go ahead, Marcia. Is there a test with like three, two little text? No, no, just him or her. And that's, that's bad enough. I'll take little kids any day of the week. Um, our fleet, we have 11 type D buses, which are the big buses. Uh, eight of them are brand new electric buses holding 78 passengers. Two of them are, are older 78 passenger diesel buses. And the only reason why they're still here is because they're 2013 and 15, and we were able to keep them through the car program. We have one large electric wheelchair school bus that just came in. And then we have 13 type D special education buses, four ambulatory diesel buses that don't meet the requirements for uh, disposal and grant money. We have five electric ambulatory buses, so they hold 22 passengers, three electric wheelchair buses, and then one diesel wheelchair bus. That's a 2015-16 that it was brand new when I came on. Um, we have one passenger white fleet van, a shop truck, and then a white pickup truck. And the van we actually got from the ag department. So when the ag department surplus their van and bought a new one with career tech ed money, we were able to purchase that from the ag department and incorporate that into our fleet. And that, that van has been instrumental for our transition program students. They use it every day. Yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to the transportation report. This is a picture of us on Cherry Valley's beach day. Um, so half of the fleet is the new buses and then there's two diesel buses. Bus routing. We have three secondary rural routes for home to school, Lakeville, Two Rock, and Pengrove. Our special education routes are for the T for uh, TK through to ages 22, one wheelchair uh, route, and then three ambulatory. And Marcia, if you could just say a little bit, we're obligated, we're mandated to provide transportation for special education special education students who have transportation in their IEP. Right. Can you speak to a little bit, what are the requirements for home to school? Cause these are all three of these are rural routes. So our rural routes really don't have, I mean, you got to live out in the area, right? So Tamales, Two Rock, uh, we go all the way out to Walker Road right now. And then Pengrove goes all the way down to, I believe it's Curtis Lane. And then we come back out. So if you live within that area, right? Or you have an inner district agreement for Petaluma High in that area, then we're, we're bringing you in. Um, so that bus in the morning, the Pengrove bus, I think is running about 50, 60 kids. And the Coast Guard base bus is 40 to 50. But most districts have actually eliminated home, home to school. school transportation. Very few operate. Even when I was in Novato, oh, so many decades ago, we operated home to school and special ed. And we I are one of the few route or districts that do free home to school transportation. Everybody right. else is charging. Yeah, and so is that uh, for the special, is that funded by the feds or, or not? We get the same, it's all rolled into the LCFF funding. Oh. So we don't get any federal money for transportation. We budget for it ourselves in LCFF. Yeah, yeah so we, um, we cover that cost by the district. And then we also bill our, our neighboring districts when we're transferring their students for special education. Then we right. do a bill back based on the first student daily rates. So we have a formula and a calculation we use. Okay, so there's... Um, Okay, I think that first piece is a repeat. Uh, we also do a contract route for Cinnabar, a home to school route for them. And we bill them back for and that. We, yeah, I was gonna say I that. Was gonna, so, so, so basically this is like yeah. them piggybacking onto our contract. So we work with first student to provide them with the home to school bus and a bus driver obviously through first student. And then we charge them back um, for that amount. That's it. It's yeah, yeah, they they actually contract through us for a home to school bus to provide transportation for their students. Uh, bus routing continued. Uh, special education we do uh, for county office, the Sonoma County Office of Education, the non public schools, Anova, North Valley, all of the north uh, non public schools, and then other parent placements at various school sites in Sonoma County. So depending on where their placement is, we're taking them. So we, we could go to Sonoma, we go all the way up to Airport Boulevard on, for ANOVA. Um, so they're far, they're spread far apart. 
Uh, we do have nine contracted routes with first student right now, three wheelchair and six ambulatory. And then we also would do uh, therapies if anybody needs them, which is for South County or uh, SCO. And th those are during the day usually. Right, they're in the middle of the day. Bus routing, uh, drivers arrive as early as 6.30 to complete their pre-trip inspection. And then they leave the yard between 6.55 and 7.15. Routes normally end between 8.30 and as late as 9.30 if they have preschoolers. And then our afternoon routes start as early as one o'clock and we go until 4.45. Uh, number of students we've served, uh, 260 students uh, total for morning and afternoon routes for the rural areas for home to school routes. And then our special education students, we transport 252 students with an average of nine students per bus, which is a large number. Most don't put that many students on the bus. And I would just comment the home to school, if you could go back for a second. Yes. <clears throat> the home to school, um, Marsha alluded to it earlier, not only do we provide free home to school, which we're not necessarily obligated to do, most districts like in San Rafael, when I was there, we charged bus pass rates of anywhere from around 360 to $400 per, um, per year for transportation. And, um, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but, but what happened when this district went to free home to school transportation, I'm not talking special ed, is that we stopped actually issuing transport bus passes or having students even apply for it. So it's very difficult for us to know who's on a bus. Anybody can jump on a bus at any time. And so one of the things that we're looking at for next year is actually changing that, not necessarily charging for bus passes, although that's something we could consider, but at least having an application process where someone's saying, hey, I want my student to ride the bus, having behavior agreements so that students know what kind of behavior is expected when they ride the bus, um, and then also we can track who's on a bus because like, for example, when we need to change a route because of flooding, which we've had to do more this year than I think in all the time. Ever. Yeah. In my time here. Yes. So it's difficult for us to even know who do we notify for the Pangrove bus if we need to tell students, hey, we can't get all the way down to Curtis Lane or road. We need to pick you up at Pangrove. It, be it becomes very challenging. We have to look to the bus driver to see who, who that person remembers is on the bus. So that's one of the things that we'll probably be bringing back a policy for next year so that we can actually at least know and have a process by which people say, hey, I want to take the bus. It just, <clears throat> it was something that um, I was curious about uh, what constitutes rural, um, you know. Living it, out on Lakeville. I mean, is there is there like a definition? I mean, like how far out Lakeville or? I, I um, think she means in general. In a, general, because it used to have a two mile radius from the secondary school and it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. So not with these, well, when I came, these routes have been in place for a long time. So I've just adapted to what we've been doing. Uh, the rule, the Lakeville bus goes all the way out to Lakeville three, uh, which is almost to the racetrack and because we can't turn around anywhere else. So we go as far as we can turn around. Um, and then- It's Pen hard to turn. It's hard to turn <laughs> for you. We can't make you turns. I mean, we, yeah, they don't turn on a dime. These newer buses, yes, they do turn quite nicely, but um, we're not flipping a UE in the middle of an intersection. I think soon. specifically, we're not required to do home to school we are not. transportation. So there is no obligation. Okay. If, if that's, I think, what your question that's is, part of the question? Yeah. yes, we're not legally required to do that. We, we do it because, number one, we want our kids to get to school. And because of the nature of Petaluma Joint Union High School District, not the elementary, we have a Pengro, which is a very large area in our high school district. And that would be hard. I mean, my daughter went to sixth grade in Pengrove and she took a Petaluma bus to Petaluma Junior High back in the day. Two Rock is way out there. I mean, that's like 10 miles out. Well, you're, and you're capturing those students that could possibly go to Tamales, right? So you're, you're bringing in potential students that nothing wrong with the Tamales. Um, you're bringing in students from out of the areas that could go to other schools right. and they're give, being given the luxury of going to it, you know, to the high schools. And we also want to make sure those kids can get to school. We want them to, to be in school. Yes, Ms. Hester. Does that include the Coast Guard? Yes, I go in. It's I'm the one who actually goes into the Coast Guard. So yes, that includes the Coast Guard base. So you're a driver too? I am. Oh. Even, even Tim Colvin, who is our very 
esteemed 45 year, 46, 46 sorry, year <laughs> bus mechanic drives a bus quite often. We're, we're so short staffed at bus drivers and the need is so great that there are many times if someone calls in sick, then yeah. But Marsha drives, I think every day. So yes. yes. Bus driver slash trainer slash director. We're trying to get her into food service so she can do some of that too. <laughs> Feeling sick. Okay, field trips. Uh, types of field trips, we do day trips and weekend trips, averaging this year at 100. Um, unfortunately, that number is low due to the driver shortage. So field trip hours as of right now are between 8.45 and 1.30. This is to ensure that there is afternoon route coverage because if we pull a driver off of route to go to a field trip, we're scrambling to figure out how to cover that. The number of field trips is less than previous years due, it, due to a couple of reasons. The first being that the driver shortage, there continues to be a driver shortage that is nationwide. Um, other states are using National Guard to drive buses. We in California cannot do that because of the laws and regulations that we have. Um, we're one of the strictest that there is. Most other states don't have to get out of their bus to escort students across the road. California does. So it's we can't pull people off and go, hey, you want to be a bus driver? It doesn't work that way for us. So that's part of California's biggest problem right now is our rules and regulations are so tight, we can't just bring in anybody. She's trying to get me to drive, but... I asked several times. <laughs> uh, we continue to work diligently to hire new drivers. The second reason, and we are still awaiting our infrastructure. Unfortunately, there is a massive backlay on parts. So with all the new electric buses that came in, we're using portable chargers and we've, they're, they're limited because of pulling power. So if we pull a, a, a bus to do a field trip, we can't do a home to school route because that bus doesn't have a charge enough to get to the afternoon. Right now, the Coast Guard base <clears throat> on Wednesdays because it's early out and we take all the junior high home first and come back and get the high school because of the bell schedules and go all the way back out to the, the Coast Guard base. We have to swap buses at, at, in the midday. So the driver that drives the bus in the morning has to come back and pre-trip a second bus in order to be able to do that entire route. Yes. Will that change once you get the- um... It will, because we'll have a fast charger, which will charge a bus in 15 to 20 minutes. So we'll actually have two. So, yes. so the, the, the challenge is we ordered, so we've been working with pg &E. They had to engineer their side of the meter. We had our engineering done. We ordered, it, it's gonna require a transformer and two switch gear two switch gear because one does the fast chargers right. and one does the trickle truck chargers for lack of a better word. Right. So those we can't get until August, even though we've ordered, we're tracking on it. We're trying to get them. So we're ready to go, but we have to have switch gear in order to complete the project. So we're hopeful for next school year, but it's been a challenge. And remember the grant requirements is that when we, when we take, when we take ownership they deliver an electric bus. Mm -hmm. We have a short window to turn in, have dismantled, crushed um, all of the old fuel buses. So we can't just keep them and say, no, we can't get rid of them until we get the charging stations. So that's, the, that's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, as we continue to hire new drivers and once our infrastructure is completed, the number of our field trips will increase along with the hours that we're able to offer. I have a question about that. Yes. What has the re what is the recruitment? I guess Jason, you can jump in here. Uh, what has the recruitment process been for trying to get new drivers and hiring? Well, a part of it has been looking at how many hours we're offering. And so, um, you know, many of our bus drivers work anywhere from three and a half to four and a half, five hours, depending on the routes that they drive. But lately we actually recruited for six hour and eight hour and we were able to find three drivers, one of which was already certified and two that need to be trained. Um, and what we're gonna talk about a little bit later is because we pay to train. So they're, while well, they're on the clock, they're being trained. Mm -hmm. um, but what we'd like to do is talk about more white fleet so that we could actually leverage drivers that are in training because they could actually drive nine passenger white vans um, to do short trips, like whether it's the therapies trips or, or other types of maybe, like if, if um, tennis has a meet, then we could take them, we can't have more than nine passengers, but we could take smaller groups. So that's one of the ideas that we're gonna talk about when we get to the transportation report. But part of it's been number of hours and then, but we also need to be able to keep them busy for eight hours. 
So that's been kind of the challenge. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And we have been recruiting actively. We even had when Ashley Collingwood was here, we actually had banner created and put up on that because you know our transportation yard is near the freeway. So we've got a big banner up. I mean, but so we have a banner at the fairgrounds or the racetrack, I should say, and one in front on top of our shop. And so it's visible from the freeway. But I think the number of hours is where we really, you know, are if we can guarantee a certain number of hours, we're going to do better. But there's a cost to that. All right. Did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think I think um, in general, like also the past the past two years, like starting to leverage other other hiring platforms rather than just ed join um, because a lot of our classified positions people that aren't already in the school system they don't use that so i think we've had more success using other platforms rather than than ed join for classified all the classified positions including our drivers mm -hmm. yeah but we've even gone out and gone and put them in um, transportation publications in the past where you know Casto. exactly so yeah. we've we've we try to target these more specialized positions in different publications so we can try to get a broad, broader audience where there's an interest. But I think, I, I, anyway, so that's it. Home to school transportation reimbursement program. The home to school transportation reimbursement program was implemented by Assembly Bill AB 181, Chapter 52, Statutes of 2022 and amended by AB 185 chapter 571 statutes of 2022. It improves or it provides reimbursement funding for school districts and county offices of education based on the prior year eligible transportation mm -hmm. expenditures and prior year local control funding formula transportation related add-on funding. California Ed Code section 39800.1 as a condition of receiving apportionments, apportionments of under section 41850.1, a local education agency shall develop a plan describing the transportation services it will offer to its pupils and how it will prioritize planned transportation services for pupils in, transport, in transitional kindergarten, kindergarten in any grades one to six inclusive, and pupils who are low income, the plan shall be adopted by the local education agency's governing board on or before April 1st, 2023, and updated by April 1 each year thereafter. Petaluma City Schools is committed to ensuring that transportation continues to grow in order to serve our students. So with that, that's our segue into what you have in front of you. We have more copies. I'll try to go as quickly as I can through it. Um, so what's an eligible transportation <laughs> expenditure? Well, let, yeah. <laughs> let's That's talk the, about that okay but let's go through the report and i'll at the end we're going to talk about the expenditures and stuff I'll, I'll jump in okay so they've got copies already um here's one of our buses as it's being delivered so this is one of our new and marcia point out at the top it's got a bluebird that shows that it's an electric yeah, so the, bus the, in order for i didn't want green bumpers so in order to eliminate that we have a green bird with a plug it on the at the very front, tail. you can see there's a green bird up there. <laughs> That's how you can tell if it's an electric bus or not, just for you to know. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> I just thought I'd point that little factoid out. Anyway, so on the first page of the report it is the introduction, which Marsha just kind of talked about about the plan itself. Um, what we're doing in this in this plan is really highlighting all of the components that they expect to be in the plan. So there's the introduction, which Marsha just talked about what who we are as a district so we kind of just go into we're two different districts how many kids we serve our community all of our programs like south county consortium and our various schools and charters so um then we go on to describe transportation services which marcia has just done to a certain extent she's talked about how many buses and so on and so forth so i'm not going to go through all that you can read it here but it is part of the plan. Um, and Mark, Marcia just outlined it in the um, PowerPoint. Um, we talked about the rural routes and remember those routes are really only for junior high and high school students. So we don't provide any home to school transportation for elementary students. We provide special education transportation, but the home to school routes are primarily designed around Petaluma Joint Union High School District because our boundaries literally go from beyond Stafford Lake in Nevada, all the way up 
Roberts Road in, in um, just outside of Katadi and almost Roner Park. So we have a very, very large Petaluma Joint Union High School District boundary. And so really these, these rural routes are almost necessary just because of, of who we are and, and the expanse of, of space that we take up. Um, we're also, um, I'll just point to the paragraph, um, we were also one of the first schools to receive, or that's when we first received our electric bus. And Marsha, I just wanna shout out to her that she was able to get all of these grants in order to convert the majority of our fleet. Not all of our school buses were eligible for that. And that's why we weren't able to really replace all of the fleet. But in hindsight, we really couldn't anyway, because again, we have to have the infrastructure of catch up. But we are continuing to look at options like that. Um, we talked a little bit about transportation for pupils with disabilities, homeless children, and foster youth. And so we do a combination of things to support the homeless and foster youth children, sometimes because if they're coming from way out, we can't necessarily get a, a bus there, especially with the limitations. So a lot of times we'll use other forms of transportation, whether it's employee and um, parent reimbursements or, or taxis or some other form, if we can partner with another organization like West County or someone else to be able to transport students, we'll do that as well. So we try to leverage our partners. Um, and then a description of how unduplicated students are able to access homeschool. We've talked about that a little bit. Um, we um, also have our Petaluma Transit, who's a partner with us, and they also provide a city bus. It goes mostly all over town. Um, and we work with them closely. I know the high school principals and the, high, and the junior high principals work with them closely as well to kind of design routes around the needs of schools. So they kind of look at what are our bell schedules and then they design their routes accordingly. Um, so that's one partner that we have that kind of helps give students more access and more flexibility, more flexibility than our, our school bus routes would potentially offer in town. And I can say, we lived on the east side of the town at the time when my daughter went to Petaluma Junior High and she took the Petaluma Transit bus even back in 2000 to get home. So that's been going on for quite a, quite a while. And then um, as far as what we've done to include our constituents, um, we, we mailed a copy of this or we emailed to Sandra who's had a chance from a PFT perspective to take a look at it. As she said to me, it was her first transportation plan and it was riveting, right? I'm gonna say <laughs> we met with um, CSCA yesterday, kind of reviewed the plan with them, talked with them, got their input, and actually incorporated some of the input into the summary, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Marsha, do you want to talk about who else you've also I emailed to? Uh, Bay Area Air Quality and CARB, uh, and then uh, I emailed Jared at Petaluma Transit and spoke to him. So it specifically outlines some of the out, outside organizations that they want, they consider our stakeholders. We also posted on the website and this presentation tonight as a way to kind of make it more public to our community. So then to the money. <laughs> so there's a calculation and they give us this. And so what we do is we look at the total transportation expenses. So when we do those SACS reports, and we down all these state reports that are in second interim. When we file unaudited actuals, it actually looks at what's called a function, function 3600, which is people transportation. So every cost that we associate with function 3600, it looks like and looks at and identifies. Um, and so that's what's here. We and this is all based on last year's calculations. So we looked at what was the total function 3600, and it's about just over five point, almost five point two million dollars. Then we go in and we say, okay, is any of that capital outlay? And the answer is yes, because we purchased buses. Um, and so we had to back out the amount of the capital bus expenditure because they're not going to give us 60% of that, unfortunately. And then we look at any non-agency expenditures that we code. And non-agency are like we have, um, we have a large mechanics shop. So pupil 3600 is for bus drivers the director, the secretary, the dispatcher, anything associated specifically with people transportation, special ed from the school, doesn't matter. The first student contracts, et cetera. Then we have the mechanics who work on the red fleet, fire trucks, ambulances, 
city vehicles, city vehicles, and they work on our maintenance vehicles and they work on buses. So they do a whole thing that's charged to like a non-agency expenditure. It's not charged to people transportation. What we do then, and that's where we buy all of our fuel. So our fuel is over here under this other program. We buy all of our fuel because the city purchases fuel from us. The fire department purchases fuel from us. The maintenance department, food service, all of these non-people transportation entities, both in-house and across town purchase fuel. So we have a separate budget where we charge all of the mechanic, fuel, oil, additives, parts, specific bus parts we charge off to the bus, but non-bus parts, things that we don't know, like oil, we don't know if it's gonna be used on a bus or if it's gonna be used on a truck. So then what we do is we allocate costs accordingly. So if, if the mechanic has worked on a maintenance vehicle or if the maintenance vehicle has purchased fuel, we charge maintenance back for that. If food service, we charge food at the city, we charge the city. So we track our fuel, what we sell, who uses, who comes in and pumps. We have um, software that does that just like a gas station. And then we, we, we charge people back, the departments and or the city. That would be an example of non-agency. So the amount that we charge to people transportation of those costs become people transportation costs, but the amount that got, gets charged to maintenance does not. Does that make sense? So we don't have any of that because we don't use a function 3,600 in those accounts. Um, so then what we do is we look at our LCFF calculations. So back in the day under the old revenue limit, it was separate. And we used to get all these state categoricals. Well, two of the state categoricals were special transportation and home to school transportation. And we got funding, two different sources of funding from the state that we, most districts primarily use for special ed transportation because they could use all of it for special ed. They didn't have to use, and it never paid for it. During the great recession in 2008 or nine, when they cut categoricals, they cut them by 20%, everything, including transportation. And then with the inception of the LCFF, they took a whole bunch of categoricals, roughly 36, some we had and some we didn't, and they rolled it into the base grant awards of the LCFF calculations. And that's preserved there. They've never increased them. That 20%, they rolled in the 80%, the difference. <clears throat> so I have to then take it and back that out. So we've come up with our total costs minus non-agency, minus capital outlay. And then we say, what 60% of that? minus the LCFF that we already have in our local control funding calculations. Um, and that becomes the amount that's reimbursable at that 60%. And for us, um, it's 276,000. And then uh, it's just a breakdown of all of the costs or what comes next, salaries and benefits, <clears throat> books and supplies, services. Most of that is the um, first student contract. The capital outlay, you can see that's the buses. Um, and then the total expenditures. And this is all based on last year. So we can look down here as a, we're still coming out of the pandemic uh, in terms of demand on our transportation. Certainly for, um, for field trips, yes. But with regard to home and school and special ed transportation, no. I mean, we operated transportation. We, we had, yes, we only had what, seven routes with per student last year, mm -hmm. where normally we have nine. So it was down a bit, absolutely. Um, field trips are also in here. So when the school sites code field trip costs, um, it's kind of a credit to transportation. It's a journal that we do. But if they're contracting out for, um, some of the tour buses or whatever, that's also included here because that function 3,600, it's not, it doesn't say what's just under Marsh's control. It also looks like the school site budgets too. It's minimal comparatively, but it is in here as well. Okay. And then lastly, the summary of transportation services. Um, I kind of added this section <laughs> because when we met with CSCA, we had a really good robust conversation about gathering their input and kind of having thoughts about how we could add and make this report a little bit more meaningful. So one of the things we talked about is um, the nationwide challenge with recruitment and all of that. And then also how do we, how do we improve that? So kind of Joanna, what you weren't talking about, how do we do a better job of recruitment? And so we, um, we think we can partner with CSEA and work on 
maybe some recruitment strategies, whether it's something like a signing bonus, we don't know, but we want to work with them. And they're, they've basically thrown out their willingness to partner with us um, to try to do that. So we're super excited about that. We wanted to add that here that we're going to partner with them to try to find ways that we can improve our recruitment abilities. Um, so anyway, that's one thing. That's the first paragraph. And then the second paragraph is if we're gonna get 200 and some odd thousand dollars, and I hate to say I'll believe it when I see it, but a little bit of that. Um, once we know what that looks like, because are they gonna give it to, to us with strings attached? Are they not? I mean, I don't know how in practicality that money's gonna come in the form of a grant. I don't know. So let's assume it's a little bit, you know, let's assume we have more flexibility you know, we want to reinvest it into transportation. We don't know how long this opportunity will last, honestly. I, I do believe there's a financial downturn on the horizon. I don't know what that will look like exactly. To me, this is soft money from a state perspective. So one of the ideas that we have is really in reinvesting it into White Fleet, more White Fleet that gives us more flexibility while we're training drivers. Um, to do things like supporting um, programs like the transition program that we have. It uh, gives us an opportunity to um, maybe do more field trips or looking at like music or even athletics. How do we kind of leverage having a white fleet? And then also looking at um, electric or hybrid, which are not cheap. I mean, we've done some investigation. You wanna share a little bit about? A, a full electric white van with nine passengers is $178,000. Yeah. So, you know, maybe this money could get us two of them, one and a half. Bless you. We put in some maybe to buy two. So it's not, it's not necessarily cheap. Um, there is a grant that's an HFIP, but we're, we've been working on that um, as well. It's the hybrid. No, go ahead. It's a it's a grant that's offered to us. The district pays half, and then HFIP can come up with possibly fifty percent at most. Um, but that's been something we've I've been working on. And this this could be the matching funds to try to do that. And then also maybe we look at hybrid. The fifth the the um, the passenger van the the electric vans are really fifteen passenger that are converted to nine passenger by converted. They literally have to go through some decertification or some process. You have to where go through a recertification to be a nine passenger van. You can't potentially take a 15 passenger van and pull a seat out and make it nine because the state says, well, you can put the seat back. So no, you can't do that, right? So then we have to take it to somewhere and have it recertified as a nine passenger van only. Where so they were not as easy as the opportunity for us to put seats back in, right. basically. But the, the beauty of that, and that's why they're so expensive in part, because these are bigger vans. The beauty of the nine passenger slash 15 passenger almost is that it gives you storage. So if you're going to go to, I'm just going to use golf, where you've got a smaller group of people who might be going to an event, but they have golf clubs, then you've got the opportunity to have a little bit more storage than in just a regular nine passenger van. So that's one of the things that we're exploring um, for this year, trying to think about that. And then there's the question of how long would it take to order the vans? How, how fast can we get them? There's the whole procurement issue, but it's something we've been actively talking about for the last several months, trying to figure out how do we, when, when I got the price tag, I was a little sticker shocked. Had a little sticker shock, yes. And you know, I'm hesitant to just buy <coughs> gasoline vans. I mean, we could do that and it could take some pressure off because they're going to be more in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range, it doesn't move us toward our target. But at the same time, we have this huge need, so we may have to consider doing a combination of some, a couple of electric and a couple of um, gasoline vans to kind of get us there. So these are some of the things that we're grappling with. So that's our presentation. Any questions? You're welcome. Yeah, I. Oh, okay. go ahead, Sheldon. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, so, uh, thinking and just listening to the, um, budgeting for transportation really helped me, you know, I, I can see where the, um, special ed home to school is a, you know, it's a very predictable cost, I would think, but field trips, 
uh, and athletics, I'm guessing is a lot more volatile to plan for. So walk me through that process of how in LCFF, we budget, not only budget enough for field trips and athletics, but then how do we allocate the, those opportunities among the schools? Because when we get field trip requests, it seems like it's whoever puts it at, you know, in there in the queue first. But how are we thinking about it from a budgetary perspective? I think I th first, first know that Marsha does an amazing job trying to navigate and help school sites navigate. How can we make it work? How can we work with them? Like we want to go on this field trip. We want to pick up at this time and, and have you come. Well, you, we want you to pick us up in the morning and drop us up in the afternoon. Well, if you can change that by a half an hour, we can do it in-house. And she'll work with them to try to say, if we can pick up 15 minutes sooner and drop, you know, and pick up in the morning 15 minutes sooner than we can make. Otherwise, you're going to be contracting out for some sort of other alternative like a tour bus. Let's say it goes down that route because they can't change it. It's the nature of the thing. Then she goes out and actually will help them find X number of options, the most cost-effective option. And then she goes out and verifies that the driver is safe, that the driver is certified. I mean, talk a little bit about that because these are things that I don't think people realize that we do to assist the school sites. Can you speak so to that a little bit? So if we send a, if somebody does a trip um, that's out way past what we can do, say they don't want to come back till 320. We can't do it, we, they can't, we can't get creative, right? We will call certain charters that we have a great relationship with, we'll get quotes, we'll send the quotes to the teacher or whoever's in charge of that field trip. They give us a yay or a nay and we tell them, look, you gotta act quick because unfortunately there is also a demand for charter buses because everybody else is short as well, right? So as soon as they give us the heads up of, yes, we'll take the cheapest one, we tell them we book it, the day of the trip, I tell them that they have to be there 15 minutes prior to their departure. I go out, I inspect the bus, make sure that the driver has his credentials and not just a copy. You have to have them actually on your person. We had that happen this year for a football game. I had to send the driver away. He didn't have his credentials at all. Um, I make sure that it has enough tread depth on the tires, that he's certified, the bus is certified or within the 13 months that it has to be. It's a process. So it's not just, we don't let the... We don't let the schools say, book your trip. We, we take over saying, let us help you. We know what, we know how to get the cheapest. We know how to, who's vetted, who's not vetted, who's reliable and trustworthy. And when we farm that out, who pays for that? The, and the school sites do. So typically it's an athletics budget or it's a school type PTA. It comes out of the same budget, if you will, that they use to pay for the field trip itself. And they also pay for the in-house transportation. So we, oh, they do. They okay. do. Okay. It's I, just it's it's cheaper because we don't we we're not out to make money. We we charge a nominal amount per field trip, but they pay for it. That's always been. And that's coming out of their site budget. Mm -hmm. It's I see. Mostly it's coming out of local grants and donations, PTA booster. You know, mostly they're doing fundraising to go to this place. And then transportation is a part of that, whether it's outdoor education or whether it's just a day, a daily field trip. So that's pretty standard. And, and we really districts. do try to get them to wiggle their time so that we can. How, how much is the difference in cost for a field trip? Would you guess on the average? I know it's varies. It depends it on a lot of things. Depending on where they're going, right? Yeah, it could yeah. be anywhere between 500 to 1,000. For the kind of farming out. Right. Versus in-house, it would be what? I mean, we're, we're typically three to $400, maybe depending on where they're going and how long the trip is, it could go up to five or six, but not, okay. we're nowhere near right. a charter. Okay. Does that apply also for sixth grade camp? Because it's part of all outdoor education. We well, haven't had any sixth grade camp buses. Because sixth, well, because probably because, because of the, COVID. Well, the, no, the challenge is, oh. no, there, there has been sixth grade camp, just not, yeah, not us. So the problem with sixth grade camp is we can't afford bus drivers to go away overnight. And so they're going to Yosemite or they're going to wherever they go. They're staying for three or four nights. How do we do that? So typically they're using parent vehicles or they're, they're doing another form of transportation. Is that a question? Oh, did you? Ask all of you. Just a cool follow up. So, you know, we had the experience recently. Uh, I mean, this happens a lot, but, you know, so they had the option of um, it was a straw project out at Lazy R and 
um, they couldn't fit it into your schedule. And so the option for the farming out was too expensive. And so they called, you know, 20 parents to go uh, drive their students over there, uh, which I guess was free to the site. But what, what liabilities do we have as a district when we get 20 parents to drive three kids each out to on a field trip? Well, their liability, I mean, they take on the liability and they're supposed to have an authorized driver with insurance. There's a form they have to sign and they have to have an adequate amount of insurance. Um, so that, that, because really any, any accident falls on the car and the driver. So the car and the driver is taking on a lot of potential liability. That doesn't mean that we're not going to get pulled into it. How to quantify that? I, I don't know. I think it, you, typically it comes down to how, how good of a job has the school site administrator done making sure adequate forms are filled out, releases are done, all of that stuff, having all their ducks in a row is really what that would take, including making sure that the driver has adequate insurance coverage. It's, it, again, this is why it's, it's hard because, because of the constraints that we've had and we'd rather have kids on a bus, not even the white fleet, We'd rather, buses are built like tanks. I don't know if that's a good thing to, you know, <laughs> analogy to use at this point, but buses are built to withstand the worst and have people walk away. Their cars aren't. And so we would rather have kids on a bus. And that's why we're, we're trying to do everything we can to try to have more availability. A white van with a certified driver would also be better. because we're maintaining these vehicles. I mean, Marsha does a really good job. That's why her title is director of maintenance, the director of transportation and fleet maintenance. It's the fleet maintenance piece. And we track all of the maintenance records for all of our vehicles. And we, you know, we try to do a really good job making sure that we can maintain our fleet, whether it's making sure tires are at the right pressure. And, you know, when's the last time I went out and checked my tire pressure or my tread to make sure it's safe to take people in my car. Most of us don't do that regularly, but in transportation we do. And so our white vans, I believe no matter what, certified driver and having someone overseeing their maintenance is gonna be a better option. And I assume that all goes for after school as well, not just field trips during the day, but after school athletics, they need to have the parents well, we, uh, with insurance and all of that driving other students. And we do offer overtime to our bus drivers. Like if, if there's an athletic or a night event, I mean, we- well, That gets tricky, right? Because night events, like for me, I came on this morning at 4.30 to check roads. I only can be on duty for 16 hours. So mm -hmm. if you're pulling a driver off to go to an athletic event that goes late and beyond their time, then they are off the road the next morning because right. of our parameters. So those all get tricky and we have to mm -hmm. be creative to, on how we can- make it work so that we're not losing a driver in the morning. Otherwise we're playing roll the dice again the next but, morning. But one of the things we did four years ago, we, we were very much going down this path of trying to do greater athletic transportation, for example. And one of the things we found is that it was more effective for us to take the kids there and then have parents pick up because a lot of the parents went to the game and picked up anyway. So then we, we would be driving back with one or two kids on a bus Verse, and so one of the things that we could consider is being able to do more of that, where we're taking the big group of kids and their equipment or whatever, and then we're not staying and hanging out there, which puts us in jeopardy of them being able to drive bus the next morning, and then parents come and pick their kids up. So that's one thing that we could consider is more of that type of thing. So at least we're covering half the trip. So I have a, two questions, I guess, related to that as well. Um, how much of this is relayed? So I, I saw that you guys spoke with stakeholders, various folks in the community. How much of this work was done with principals and how much, I guess, education is done with coaches and how much, I guess, like, were they a part of this? Just because from my kids playing sports, we're always just told there's no buses, the district won't provide buses. It costs thousands of dollars for buses. So it's just a no straight out. It seems like there's not an ask. There's just like this expectation that it's just like a no. So I'm just wondering what is the education piece and what can we maybe do 
to educate well, folks more. I think that there, I think that we, we, I think that there's more we can do. I can tell you though, we had full blown committee. We met with the athletic directors, the system principals, coaches. This was probably 2018, 19. It was just before the pandemic hit. And maybe even earlier, it might've been more like 17, 18, 19, kind of in that 18 month window, trying to get athletic transportation going. And it was super challenging. I'm, I'm, I mean, because just because think about the nature of they want a, 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 an event. And so now we have another event tomorrow and we have to go. We, we, we just can't be that nimble to try to pull together a bus driver for some of the stuff that happens. And even trying, I mean, you can, you can speak to this directly, trying to get information out of the school sites. Why don't you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's not always organized, right? So a coach will call and give us X, Y, and Z, right? And then the secretary calls and goes, no, it's A, B, and C. And then you got the principal saying, no, nope, that's not right either. And then what do you what do you do as a driver? I'm giving my people and expecting them to know where they're going, but now they have, oh, that wasn't the right place. I'll give you an example. We just did a trip for a high school. I won't say which one. And they told us Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. And we sent the charter bus to Santa Rosa. And when he, the driver got to Katati, he was told, hey, it's Petaluma, you're going the wrong way. Well, I mean, now I feel like a fool because I just sent that charter driver to the wrong location because I was provided the wrong information because everybody's got their hands in the pot and it's not accurate. So we, in order for us to be able to be creative and get, you know, hey, let's, let's take your volleyball team at 1.30 and we can drop them off in Napa and come back, mm -hmm. right? Then we're, we're dumping you out. We're bringing you to Napa. And then we're back for an afternoon route by 2.30 and that's pushing it. But now with the bell schedule is a little bit different. We could, you know, it's tight, especially going to Napa and back, but let's get creative. People don't want to let their kids out of school that early. So then I can't be that creative because that option doesn't work. So we actually do do a lot of behind the scenes work. And, and what we learned through that athletic transportation, we were getting a lot of pressure to try to make it work. And we really, I would it say- It was a lot of tears. <laughs> because what we found is that you've got so many people walk on coaches and others mm -hmm. trying to get good solid data in time for us to actually schedule buses and I'm talking about athletic transportation in particular it was super challenging and this is before we had all the shortages and pandemic and all right. that and we but it also we, comes down to football being both Petaluma and Casa are both away on a Friday night now I'm down two drivers and they most likely couldn't come that morning so now I'm down and then they're out, two drivers are out an entire day and we're, we're gonna have to figure out how to cover those routes. And that's pulling my mechanic and at the time Guillermo trying to cover things to make sure that everybody had a way home from school because that's my priority, right? Mm -hmm. And then everybody had their trip to football or whatever it was, or maybe the other problem is if you don't get an accurate return time. Right. So say that the coach tells me, oh, we'll be back by 9.30. And that's inaccurate. And I've got a driver calling me at 9.45 going, hey, I'm out of hours and I'm now in Napa. Well, you have to bring them home. And then I'll see you tomorrow afternoon because you can't come. So if they're not accurate with their information, it's just a domino effect. And we actually do pull Guillermo, who's our maintenance coordinator. We actually have to pull him to drive at times because we're so short staffed. So we've got, we're paying a director to drive and at times we're paying a coordinator and at times many times we're paying a maintenance mechanic to drive, um, a bus mechanic. So, I mean, when we say we're stretched thin, we're literally um, doing everything we can to maintain our mandate, which is special education transportation. First and foremost, that is our mandate by law. Second, and then we have foster youth, et cetera. And then second, our home to school transportation routes, which impact a lot of kids. And then from there, we try to do what we can to pick up the slack for field trips. Um, and or for athletic transportation if possible. But this is just helping you understand some of the challenges that we're up against. And, and, and we, have, we have plans to try to maybe make, a more, make more options available right. with the white fleet and having more ability. Like we could even train maybe coaches and certify them to drive these passenger vans. You know, those are possibilities that we could do. But we don't want just anybody driving them. Because then it is our liability. It's in our vehicle. So then we would own that. 
I mean, I also see a huge challenge is misinformation. Like I had a parent calling me today being told by a, a principal that it's fine, you can just drive kids. Like, um, you know. <laughs> I just... We can definitely work and put it on um, a principal's agenda and, and try to bring more. That's what I was wondering what the education piece was. Principals going to the 80s and the coaches. Because again, then I've heard other things from different coaches about options and all of that costs availability Willingness. and there's a lot of turnover in coaches and stuff so it is it is it would have to be an ongoing and and we certainly have not had the time to train coaches but we can certainly work with ed services to get on agendas and have these conversations but we even when we were meeting with the ad the athletic director and the coaches and the assistant principals regularly like every eight weeks we still struggled having everybody understand and, and feel like they could adhere to what we needed to be able to do it. So even when we were having robust meetings and conversations, as Marsha said, there was still a lot of tears. A lot of them were hers. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it was me. Yeah. So, so anyway, I'm just, so we had yeah. real time experience trying to do it and it would take a commitment on everyone's part to kind of be able to work, to work together on it and understand that we can try to do this, but you have to do your part too over here. Mm -hmm. So. Marsha, do you keep track of, um, you know, how, uh, how many of these requests for field trips and athletics and those kind of things are fulfilled in-house versus contract versus parents we, versus scrap? So we have a binder of all the ones we do. And then we have a binder of all the ones the charter bus does because when CHP comes to audit me and do my terminal inspection, I have to provide him that I've inspected those buses and ensured that the driver had their information. So we have that. We have emails saying, hey, I'm sorry, we don't, we can't help you. Um, so we could track it if we needed to. I'm just trying to get a sense of the scale of, you know, we would love, like, like, like Chris is saying, we'd love to do everything in house if we could. Mm -hmm. It seems like that we have the physical um, capacity in terms of buses. We don't have the personnel, and we don't have, and we have the scheduling problem. Well, and you also are waiting on an infrastructure, right? So, is, an you know, the whole oh, ball game yes. would change. Yes. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of the scale of where, you know, how much we're not meeting in house. I would, could I could look back and get you some numbers. Would you? Yeah, I mean, not course. only the contracting out, but then also maybe decisions to scrap if if you even know that, okay. or if you know they're just grabbing parents instead of using the contracting out. Okay. If you have any kind of anecdotal evidence, just this, you know, just okay. so we get a scale of the problem here. You got it. Thank you. Well, and I would say that um, there's a lot that we don't know about. Right. 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 And we, and there are, sometimes we have found out about stuff and gone out there and like, oh, oh no, you can't, you can't drive that vehicle. Like that's not a safe vehicle, personal vehicle. Right. So, I mean, unfortunately, yeah, we can do, we can share with you what we can, what we, what but know. there's, yeah. right. But there, that won't be the whole picture. It'd be a lower bound on how, how many are not done in this yeah. house. Is this a good place to ask about Petaluma Transit too? Sure. I mean, we can share what we know. So Yeah. So actually, you already answered my basic question, which was, you know, could we, you know, use any of this 60%, um, you know, for <laughs> home to school, you know, on public transit? And the answer is no. But um, but still, and, you know, I'm aware that they give us a, a, our students a decent discount. I'm, I'm curious how SRGC students can ride PT for free and our okay. students can't. Does anyone know the answer to that? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> so the SRJC students ride the Petaluma Transit for free, but yeah. not high school students? They have a big sign. For a few years oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can ask the question. I mean, I'm happy to reach out to Jared and say, hey, yeah. how do we get us some of that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be sweet. Well, yeah, that, that how many of our students take the Petaluma City uh, Transit? Because I know there's a lot of CASA students. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any idea what the relationship is. The, the... I, I think it's quite a few. I mean, I think that, especially the Kenilworth CASA route, I know that, you know, that's why they're putting up enclosed at Kenilworth and at CASA. So I know on the east side, I don't know as much on the west side, but I'm happy to ask the question with, 
with Jared and find out roughly how many students ride. They should know that. Yeah. And, um, and if there's anything that we can do to, to get ride for free, I just don't know. I don't know how they're, what their budgets are built on. I mean, I think I part know. of it was some outside funding because all SRJ students get free clipper cards now. Um, so they get free transit all over the Bay Area. So it's not just- So there might be a transit. state grant or something. Yeah, so it's-, it's free for years. Yeah, but I'm just saying what it is now. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. true, they do have the clipper cards now. Yeah. Don't, don't they have some kind of new money for transportation at the city? It was a grant. It was a grant that, is it still going on? I think it's going on for about two years. I know they are right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll try to get more information about that. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you. Um, we thank apologize. You. I know you've been so up long. since four. Yeah. I just I just want to say thank you so much for you know the, your grant writing. It must be like stunning for what you've done for getting all those e vehicles and getting everything else. We just keep hearing your name, and I'm just glad that I finally have met you and. Um, and, and thank you. And she thank was you. up at four, like driving Skillman yeah. and Thompson and out say, on railroad to make sure that the road was past my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank Good night. You. Thanks, Marsha. Good night. Thank you. All right. Next up. Chris again. Yes, with budget revision number two and second interim report for the fiscal year. So let me do a Oh, you know what, Mia, I'm so sorry I didn't ask if you had any questions or comments about the transportation. I know that you guys go on a lot of field trips. How did you get to Oregon when you guys went? Uh, so when we went to Oregon, I can't um, when we went to Oregon, we had separate cars. So it was chaperones, it was adult chaperones. So we had like um, board members from the museum. And then we also had like teachers, like we had Miss Jacobs mm -hmm. um, and Miss Walters. That was pretty cool. But then the uh, Marine trip, we did take a bus. It was like okay. a super fancy one. It had TVs on it. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments? No. Or? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to walk people through the binders quickly. I'm not going to go through every page. Um, I have my typical narrative that just talks about what second narrative is. I won't go through that. Under the narrative and assumptions, they are in here. If you go to, um, I don't know, it's like page of the narrative and assumptions, just before the dartboard, just before the dartboard, you'll see um, really kind of enrollment and how enrollment looks. And that's really what I wanna share with you. So the assumptions are all here. Again, I'm not gonna go with them line by line, but I wanna just show you what our enrollment looks like as of the end of January. So seabeds 2019-20, 7,521. And we are hovering at around 7,076 students. And I kind of give that to you school by school so you can kind of see that. Um, remember, some of these schools have special day class that's embedded in here. So this is fully loaded, so to speak, to use a vehicle term. Um, but you can see this is down 445 students. And just for you to know, we were last time we were here in December, it was 7,094. So it's down an additional almost 20 kids. So it's not a trend we like to see. Um, we do think that we've kind of reached the bottom of the bell curve, so to speak, and that, maybe that's what we hope. And that hopefully will start to trend back up, but I just wanted to kind of point this out. And in addition to that, we're also seeing reductions in ADA. So if you go to the, the back to the first or the third page of the narrative, actually the second page of the narrative, mm -hmm. page two, you'll see that little red section and that's really talking about the ADA. So I want, I'm, I'm comparing the ADA from where we were projecting at first interim. Now, remember we didn't have P1 yet. So that was a projection um, versus where we are at P1 because these ADA are based on P1, period one, which is in 
sometime in December, depending on the organization. The charters are a little bit different because they're year round. But we're down 43 ADA in the in the elementary, 85 ADA in the secondary, eight ADA at Pengrove, and six ADA at Cherry Valley, and PAX is staying pretty stable. So that's literally because our attendance is also down. So our enrollment's down, but also our attendance is down. And of course, we know we had the triple chat, the triple triple threat, RSV, COVID. <laughs> So we had, a, we had a challenging fall for sure. And so I'm actually projecting our revenue based on P1 because my theory, and I've never done that before. I've always assumed 1% lower at P2, but the reality is with COVID and the RSV triple threat stuff, we don't know where our attendance is gonna lie. So we're assuming it's gonna be about the same at P2 at this point, okay? But I just wanted to kind of highlight for you our ADA. On the very next page, um, again, I'm giving you our estimated ADA combined um, and then our funded ADA. So our estimated funded, funded ADA, well, you can see our, under local control funding for it, it says average daily attendance, estimated P2 at 6,556, Estimated funded ADA is 7,116. Because the funded ADA is at three year average, that still has some oh, good right. years in it. So I just wanted to show you like that's, that's what's gonna start dropping off. So that's what's actually saving us right now, okay? Can I ask you a quick question? Um, it looked, just looking over this very quickly, it looked like we're losing um, uh, students either going into it, the secondary schools. So are they leaving midway through the year? I mean, or is that due to ADA? Well, it's, it's, it's lots of reasons. I mean, at San Antonio, kids graduate early. Oh, well, so, this, was, this was mainly the Casa Petaluma. But and then the some of those kids highs. go to San Antonio. So you don't see San Antonio drop because I its see. enrollment stays stable, but they're now different kids. So a lot of times you'll see kids graduating early at San Antonio, but then other kids are going from Casa or Petaluma High to San Antonio. Yeah. Or... Okay. You know, so that's a little bit of it. That's not all of it. Some kids at the comprehensive high schools could graduate early too. I mean, but typically it's at San Antonio. Do we still have that hold harmless that we had for attendance? No, the hold harmless was we continued to use 2019-20 ADA. We had that during the pandemic and the year after we were back into in, in learning. But we lost that. So this year is the first year under the three-year average. So that hold harmless we had through 21-22, that's gone away. So now we're going to see the step-down effect unless we can get our enrollment to start trending back up and our attendance. So no, we don't have that any longer. So then I'm going to jump to the comparative price, the comparative spreadsheets and just walk you through that. There, there is the common message in this narrative and assumptions. There is the dartboard. So there's a lot of good information in there. If you, if you want to read up on that, I'm not going to go through it with you. I'm just going to quickly touch on this variances on the spreadsheets. So typically we highlight the unrestricted because that's where the board has more flexibility in how to spend money versus the restricted where money comes with strings attached. So you can see the first section, which is the LCFF. Now, if I was you, I'd say to me, well, if our ADA is down, how come our LCFF is up? <laughs> <laughs> because one reason is because our unduplicated counts were up. So we were estimating our unduplicated counts, which actually came in higher. So it's kind of balancing each other out a bit. Um, one reason is because the county office ADA, <clears throat> we were estimating higher. So they educate students on our behalf. And so when we received their P1, that was higher than what I had pr projected. So our ADA is down, but the county office's ADA was up. So those are the two primary reasons. You, you won't see a whole lot of other changes in revenues here. Um, you'll see that our contribution to special ed actually went down slightly, which considering we budgeted all of the CSEA retros, et cetera, that's primarily because our AB602 revenue was up. We got projections in in February and we were able to reproject that. And I'll point that out to you in a minute, what those look like. So if you go into the next page, these are certificated salary and benefits and classified. 
um, not a lot of changes here. You'll see a big jump in cler clerical salaries, and that's primarily because we did a large reclassification with CSEA. A lot of those positions were secretarial or in the clerical in nature positions, and so that's where you're seeing that reclassification hit. Um, going down, you'll see big increases in materials and supplies. That's a lot of that's local donations. You saw on the page one that we had collected about 114,000 in local donations. And so we budget that typically in materials and supplies. Some of that goes towards trans transportation. So if you look down here under 5845 field trips, you'll see that's also up 84,000. Part of it, that materials and supplies increase is that we, um, we bumped up the, all of the elementary school budgets by $2,000 because inflation is hitting them hard and their budgets are so small. And then looking at how they were struggling, instead of doing it a percentage, we gave everybody $2,000 because that just, that's just what we're seeing. So that's part of that. And then another part is we had to bump up custodial supplies. Custodial supplies are just because inflation's hitting us in looking at those. So that's part of what that increase is about. You'll see electricity went up, utilities. A lot of that is because we did not have access to solar at Casa and Petaluma Junior High for a large chunk of time because of the BEST project, battery energy storage system. Some of the um, equipment could not con converse. And so they had to, without us taking schools down without power, that's not easy to do during the school year. So we did um, quite a bit of that over winter break. So we were able to do a bunch of that, which is bring our, our solars back online, but we lost several months of our key months. So I'm hopeful that that's mostly one time in nature and that utilities will come back down next year. Uh, you'll see on other contract services. A lot of that is for things like outdoor education, all those other contracts that the school sites are out there doing right now. There's probably some supplemental contracts. I know Maite working with her on some of her contracts Many of those are funded by supplemental. And so as we were going through reconciling student services contracts with supplemental funding, some of that money got moved around a bit. Like a lot of Tony's contracts hit our categorical funds. Things like Sunny Hills and Side by Side and those type of contracts. And then on the next page, not a lot of variances other than indirect. Um, the thing to note is that um, that excess of revenues or expense, 3.4 million. If you look at the consent and the AB 1200 for the TA we have with PFT, that's going to quickly disappear as we budget that. So that will become, when we bring back the next budget revision, we will be in deficit spending. There's, you know, five, six, 700,000 worth of one-time expenditures in here. So we would expect to see a certain level of that. Um, but just for you to know, this is not, does not include the TA we have with PFT. Okay, and then going to restricted, I'm just going to touch on a couple of things I want to highlight. I shaded the three revenues that are um, special education. So maybe 602 is made up of some local property taxes, federal funding, and local state funding that 8792. Those three sources make up our 8602 funding. And so you can see those went up for both of our districts. And that's why that special education contribution went down, even though we had posted raises. It didn't go down proportionally because there's also increases in non-public school. Um, if you look at the very next page, just one other thing I wanna point out, you'll see a big negative in 2100 instructional assistance. Um, the majority of that relates to vacancies we had in South County that we actually had to go to a non-public agency of about $500,000. <laughs> to be able to, fulfill. so some of that is offset by raises we gave, but we actually had to take down vacancies because we had to go with a, a contract to try to fill those vacancies. For this year only, we're, we're recruiting for next year. But that was a shift. With that, I know it's late. Um, this is a positive budget. Um, there are multi-year projections under back here under supplemental information. Um, so if you go back to one page 103 under supplemental, here's where the ADA is. You can kind of take a look at how we project that charters versus non-charter. Um, it has our cash flow worksheet, which you may take greater interest to now because part of why those two banks had an issue is because of cash. Cash is king. You have to have enough cash to meet payroll, 
and to pay your bills. And reserves and cash, like what, what you heard with those two banks is that they have plenty of assets. Assets were not the problem, cash was the problem. So cash flow, I can't, I can't comment on why, I just know that if, <laughs> that we manage and monitor our cash closely because we know we have to have adequate cash on hand to be able to pay our bills, to pay, pay to bank payroll every month. So it's here, I know most people, it's not something, there's a lot of numbers here, most people don't wanna look at it, but our cash is positive, so I can tell you that. And then the next few pages are our multi-year projections. And so these multi-year projections are the ones I use in the AB 1200 disclosure for the PFT contract. So I literally took these and then projected out how they look once we post the PFT raises on the tentative agreement, okay? And then of course we have the criterion standards, which um, that's 26 pages of riveting data that you can go through 29. <laughs> that you can go through at your leisure. Any questions? I know I've gone through a lot of trying to be. Yeah, um, what is, what's the uh, line between a positive certification and qualified? Not that I wanna approach it, but <laughs> you know, uh, well, what, what is that line? Typically it has to do with your multi-year projections. And so a positive certification is where we can show with our multi-year projections that we can not only meet this year's obligations, but we can make, meet the obligations for two subsequent years based on a certain set of assumptions. And so the county office will go through my assumptions and say, I'm overstating COLA, I'm understating CPI, I'm, you know what I mean? And so they look at my assumptions and then they have to say, yes, we agree with her assumptions generally, and that we believe that we will meet our obligations for this year plus two. Negative or qualified means we may not be able to meet. So if I'm projecting two years out and by year three, we look like we have a problem, that would put us into qualified. Negative is we won't. That's usually where you don't have enough cash on hand and you're you're having to go to a loan to go, go get a loan where it's not talking about just the out years. It's talking about this year. We're not going to have enough cash to meet, to meet our cash needs. Any other questions or comments? No? All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Next up comments from the public on non agendized items. If you are in person and you'd like to make a comment, uh, please fill out one of these cards. If you're online, we're gonna open up the chat. Please put your first and last name in the chat and the item that you would like to speak about. We're gonna leave the chat open for a few minutes while I read the public comment policy. <laughs> All right. Under government code section 54954.3a, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest, providing it relates to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. While government code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, program services, and or employees, the district does have a policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. If the comment is about something that is not on the agenda, it will be heard only during the public comment on non-agendized items period. Once that part of the meeting is over, comments will only be taken on agenda items during the discussion of those items. The board values public comments, and although we cannot take action or discuss items not on the agenda, we listen carefully and appreciate input from the public. Public comments are subject to a four minute per person limit or a 20 minute limit per subject matter. So it looks like we have one in person. I don't see anyone on chat yet. Um, Katie Gill. <laughs> Jeez. I, thank I you. I appreciate that. Okay. I know. I should have warned you. All right. Um, hello. My name is Katie Gill. I have two children who attend McKinley, TK, and first grade, and I'm a teacher at PAX. 
My family lives in San Rafael and we choose to drive 30 minutes each way uh, so that we can attend and work in PCS schools. Over the last few years, mostly because of COVID, I've become an avid board member listener. So thank you for the Zoom. Um, and I take value in staying current with the district we spend so much time in. I'm here to speak with you about the elimination of the existing McKinley TKK after school site run program. I'd like to talk to you about some points uh, that have to do with the removal of the current TK program. Removing the program cuts staffing. It was noted that positions are cut, not people. When positions are cut, it will remove people from a test site. Teachers have seen this time and time again. The staff who run aftercare help in the office, do yard duty, crosswalk duty, or crosswalk duty morning care. They step in when people are out, etc. A lot of recess, rainy day duty lately. Um, cutting the TK hours will cut Ms. Kim's hours by about 18 hours a week and Ms. Lupe's hours by about 25 hours and other people who help from time to time. We all know that it will be hard for the district to find hours at our site to keep these beloved staff members who just received their release notices today. The current program has trained people who know our young students. An outside organization will not be the familiar face our youngest four-year-olds on campus see. Transitioning four-year-olds to new people every day is a hard transition for them. It's been noted that the TKK program has a waiting list, and yes, this is true, but so did our Boys and Girls Club program. That is ELOP funded um, well into the year. We know that the waiting lists are caused by staffing issues. How would an outside organization help prevent the unavoidable staffing? The removal of the TK program sought zero family input. The district does like to send out surveys and we didn't get to uh, share our feedback about the removal. I'd encourage the board to send a survey to see how happy families are with the outside organizations that we're choosing. The feedback should help drive the board's decision. During the last board meeting, Valley Vista's program was almost kept, which shows that we can make our current program work with ELOP funding. If we can, then we should keep the programs that are so loved and the staff who are invaluable to our site. The current cost of the TKK program at McKinley is a max of $55 a week. How do we know that uh, the funding or the cost will not increase? A speaker at the last board meeting noted the extremely high cost of Valley Vista's new program. I did read through the ELOP funding site. It leaves a lot of room for the district to decide what programming will look like and who provides it. Let's all be transparent with how and why we are making the decisions we're making. McKinley has a PTA meeting tomorrow and I'd encourage the board to attend to listen to the questions and concerns that our community has about the changes being placed on our staff, students, and school. I do understand that the district plans to replace the current TKK program with another program that still provides care through an outside organization, but I'm asking you now, please don't take something from McKinley just for the sake of keeping all programs the same. Every school site offers something different. Let this be one of our differences. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask you when your PTA meeting is? Because we have a, uh, oh no, yeah, it's tomorrow night. She also sent an email with the details. Right. I mean, we just, I don't think we can be there. I mean, but thank you for the invitation and for your speech. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Katie. Um, is there anyone in the chat, Dave? No. Okay. All right. Um, we are going to move on then to adoption and approval of an of the agenda. I move to adopt and approve the agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, uh, report on activities and correspondence of school board members. Since the last board meeting, um, Petal Luma Wildlife Museum tour, United Anglers of Costa Grande Fish Hatchery tour, Arts and Music Committee, Legislative Action Briefing, Read Across America at Valley Vista, McDowell, McKinley, um, office hours at CASA, Petaluma Junior, Petaluma High, Carpe Diem, McKinley, okay, period. Um, McKinley School Play, WASC Visit, um, Sonoma County State of the Arts event, class presentation at uh, McDowell's, well, at the adult school, 
ESL leadership class networking session, meeting with the city manager and Petaluma Police Department chiefs, Healthy Choices Committee, CASA Black Student Union meeting, and meeting with our state representatives. Um, Miss Mia, Petaluma Wildlife Museum open houses, in class tours, and tours for the Girl Scouts, PHS Recycle Club, Recycle Drive Planning and Advertising, PHS Safety Circle with staff and students. And Mia also led our, was one of our docents on the Wildlife Museum tour. I had never been, and I'm terrified of animals. So it was a <laughs> growing experience for me, but it was so cool. I'm gonna go back with my kids, so thank you. Anyone else wanna comment on their activities? Um, just to clarify for the uh, recycling drive, so the Petaluma um, Recycle Club, um, Petaluma High School Recycle Club is having a recycle drive on Saturday um, the 18th, and it's from 10 to 2, and we'll be out in front of the school. Hopefully it's not raining too much, um, and we'll have, it's encouraging community members to recycle their recyclables um, correctly, so we'll take their recycles, we'll, hopefully they'll be sorted by what's on the flyer, but we'll sort them for them and bring them to the um, the recycling center. And then we're also having a bake sale to raise money to get bins for the um, individual classrooms because the teachers have been wanting them. Um, and then also that will fund our um, like beach cleanup and river cleanup equipment, stuff like that. Are so advertising, so I was like out downtown and I gave out 20 flyers and some of them have in, them in their windows. So that's pretty cool. So it's Saturday, March 15th. Yes um 10 to 2. Are you looking for specific items? Is this like an electronics recycling? See, furniture? I did get that question. So it's specifically like bottles, cans, so aluminum cans, plastic bottles, and intact glass. Um, I did when I went to um the uh the video game store downtown, Nostalgia Alley, I think it's called. Uh -huh. They did ask me about that, um, like the electronic stuff. So um, maybe we can get the kids to do that next year. Uh -huh. um, but for right now, it's just like bottles, cans, and bottles. Okay. Nice. Yeah, thank you. Anyone have any other comments about their activities in the past couple of weeks? Sounds like folks are continuing to ask for more money at the state level, right? Met with uh, Assembly Member Connolly today, some folks did, and Dodd, did. you did? Okay, and Dodd tomorrow. So hopefully, all right, no, no comments? All right, we can move on to comments from the public on consent items. If anyone in person or online has a comment about anything on the consent agenda, if you're in person, fill out one of these forms. Can you pass this to Kylie? If you're online, please put your first and last name in the chat and what you would like to speak about. Um, I'm not gonna read the public comment policy again, but I'm gonna invite Sandra Larson up. Hello, my name is Sandra Larson. I live in Petaluma and I'm also the president of PFT. And we just wanna take this moment to thank the board. Uh, our newly um, negotiated TA has been ratified for our membership. It, this job is hard enough and it's way easier when we're all rowing together. And I feel like as a district and as um, PFT, we have done that and we definitely appreciate all your support. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, is there anyone online? Looks like no, no one in the chat. Okay, so we will close the chat at this time. Um, all right, approval of consent agenda by consolidated motion. I move to pull 11.2.3 from the consent agenda, which is the purchase order. 12.2.3? Uh, 12, no, I see 11, I don't we're know. On, we're on 12, right? 11. Okay, my paper's <laughs> messed up, I'm blaming on that. On, okay, on the online, paper. <laughs> online, it's 11.2.3. Okay. I moved to pull purchase that orders item. from okay. the consent agenda. Okay. Purchase orders. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. You got to make them. Now motion. I move to uh, approve <laughs> the consent agenda as amended. Second. Okay. Any questions or comments about anything on the consent agenda? Uh, just back to PFD, yeah. thanks for, um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to see on the 
on the Scali schedule was especially beefing up the, the, the uh, column one, step one for recruiting yeah, purposes. Yeah. Thank you for making that work. Really, thank you. That was mm -hmm. fabulous. Mm -hmm. I was so pleased to come back from vacation. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I just had one little comment um, about um, the re removing and replacing the asphalt at San Antonio. I just want to thank you for moving on that so quickly. We, um, when we were at San Antonio um, uh, office hours, we had all these students come in and they were talking about the basketball court. They were talking about how it was really difficult to play, um, you know, to use it, to walk it because it was so dangerous. So I was just, once again, thrilled. So thank you. Well, and unfortunately it's weather dependent. Well, so yeah. we're hoping to <laughs> find it is on there and, and, and we didn't even know that they had expressed their concern. We've just been looking at our facilities, trying to identify projects that we thought we could do over spring break. And we're hopeful to try to do that. We have a contractor identified, but it has to have them, we have to have somewhat decent weather. So it'll be a little bit dependent on that. Yeah, so anyway. <laughs> Oh, okay. You guys gotta turn your uh, microphones on so we can hear all of it. Ellen, you were saying you have office hours there tomorrow? I was just saying I'll be there tomorrow. I have office hours. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Mia, about anything? No? Okay. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 I move to approve the purchase orders, uh, item 12.2.3. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Comments from the public on action items. We will leave the chat open for about a minute on this one. If there's anyone in person that would like to speak about um, any of the action items, you can come forward now. All right, we are going to move on to the first action item. Caitlin's favorite one. I move to stay in the hybrid format for another 30 days. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, um, Jason, do you wanna talk us through this PIP request? Yeah, sure. So um, we have uh, some rising numbers of uh, students on our special ed caseload and we were needing to some additional staffing so we're bringing in um you, you know there's been challenges hiring special mm -hmm. ed staff this year uh brianna dance is going to be on a pip and she's going to be at various sites to help with some of the overflow of caseload at some of those sites so that's dependent upon the approval of her pip okay. Elementary sites, secondary, both. It, it's a little. I'd have to look at the specific sites that we worked it out, but it, I think it's a it's a mix. All right. I move to approve the PIP. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Approval of the tentative agreement to the collective 
bargaining agreement between Petaluma City and Petaluma Joint Union High School Districts and the Petaluma Federation of Teachers. I move to approve the tentative agreement. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, approval of assignments outside of credential area. By the way, that felt very anticlimactic. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Jason. <laughs> so um, I, I, you may recognize that we do this every year and um, this is uh, uh, different staff members that consistently, it's pretty much the same staff members almost every year that either are doing electives that for different reasons, they're, we feel that they're qualified to teach or um, different core subjects that they, we feel they're qualified to teach with your approval. Um, and if you look over the years, it's usually the same people doing the same thing. So this is not new. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? I move to approve assignments outside of credential area. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, oh, approval to reschedule our special board meeting from March 21st to April 25th. This was going to be our meeting that was focused on equity. And with our superintendent absent and likely getting back at the beginning of next week, I think we're asking to move the meeting just so we have more time to plan. So. I move to approve the rescheduling of the special board meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Approval of mm -hmm. the Pendleton City Elementary Joint Union High School District's budget revision number two and the second interim report for. 2022 to 2023. I move to approve budget revision two in the second interim report. With positive certification. With positive certification. With positive. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's give that one a clap yeah. too. <laughs> All right. Yes, I know that's a lot. Thank you. Okay, approval of the transportation plan. Yeah, so as you heard from Marsha, this plan has to be adopted or approved by the board before April 1st. And the reality is we're going to be bringing it back each year because we have to annually revisit it. So we'll have opportunity for more input. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we're asking for formal approval. All right. I move to formally approve the transportation plan. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And um, if you could thank her again for us, yes. that was really great. All her hard work. Yes. All right. Comments from the public on discussion. Oh, we don't have any. Okay. So moving on to future business. Does anyone have anything for future business? <laughs> yes. I think a presentation about child care once we have a clearer idea of mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. responses to RFPs we've gotten. Maybe JJ can do a presentation on um, that and get our feedback into what parameters mm -hmm. we're really looking for with these outside providers. Because one of my concerns, frankly, is that they can, they're going to be, probably be allowed to pay less than we would pay because a lot of child care providers aren't unionized and are, mm -hmm. we have CSEA. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of my concerns is that labor right. okay. issue. Absolutely. That's, yeah. All right, anyone else? It's me, I already asked you, but okay. All right, um, and action on items heard in closed session. Um, on the resolution 2223-21, it was, the motion was put forth by uh, Vice President Quinn and seconded by Trustee Webster, and it was approved five to zero. So, and with that, we are adjourned.